Hello everyone, welcome again. Chapter 3, Derivatives. We move to the next uh, part of the series, which is uh, about derivative as a function. To give you a gist of this, uh, we're saying that uh, we saw previously that f prime of x naught, which is derivative of the function at a point, exists if you were able to find uh, the uh, limit of the difference quotient. Now, uh, here we say it's a derivative as a function, no longer at a point. So what this means is that if we can find derivative at every point on a given function, then the entire function has a derivative. And so that is the point we're trying to make so that we can understand this process of finding the derivative of a function. And we call that process as differentiation. And then we say the function is differentiable. Okay, I'm going to write this uh, definition here. So here we go. If f prime exists at a particular x, then we say f is differentiable at x. This implies that f has a derivative at x. And so you can notice here that the definition no longer has f prime of x naught, but it has f prime of x. So x would be every point, it, in, it, um, it means the entire function, so we're talking about every point in the function. Okay? So f prime of x equals limit h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. And so we say if f, of f, f prime exists at every point on the function, of course on its domain, then we call f differentiable. Okay? So if they say, uh, suppose that f is differentiable and the theorem goes on like that, that in the background means that f prime of x exists. Okay? And uh, the process of calculating a derivative is called differentiation. Okay? Now we have um, an alternative formula for the derivative, and I'm going to put that up here, and then we'll look at some problems. So here we have f prime of x to be limit z approaches x, f of z minus f of x over z minus x. Now this uh, formula is, uh, is an alternative, uh, but uh, the advantage of this formula is that you can see it more visibly as y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, where x2 is a kind of approaching x1. Okay? Instead of x2 and x1, we have z and x. So that's the only change here. W whereas uh, here, the, the traditional formula involving the h, that is helpful, especially when we see that only one point is given and you can generate the other point with a plus h. So both uh, formulas have their advantages and you just want to use the one that is um, useful or meaningful to your given problem. So let's uh, start with the first one. It says differentiate. Notice the language. They could say differentiate or find the derivative. x over x minus 1. So if they simply say differentiate, then you know that because of the process, the process of calculating the derivative is known as differentiation. You know they are not talking about the tangent line, although slope of the tangent line is the derivative. You know that that's not the, uh, the interpretation they want from this particular problem. They want us to provide it in the calculus form, which is the derivative. Okay. So we are asked to find f prime of x uh, uh, is to be found or calculated. Okay, So then we have two options. We have two formulas, right? We'll use the, the one that we generally use. So using uh, definition, I'll say f prime of x, not x naught, because they didn't give us a particular point. They just said differentiate the function. And because of the definition that allows us to differentiate the function in its domain, we have this traditional definition. All right, so um, just to move into the calculations more easily, I would like to insert f of x plus h uh, right away. So your function is f of x. So in the place of x, you now have x plus h. So please watch what I'm doing. I am inserting parentheses for wherever I intend to substitute the x plus h. Okay.
So that is for the first part. Minus f of x is x over x minus 1. I'll put that also in parentheses so that we can handle them individually. Again, this leads to a complex fraction situation, so we're going to focus on the numerator. I just want you to watch what I'm doing, so, uh, or you could pause and do it on your own, come back, fast forward it to, to check the answer. Taking the LCD. So basically I'm cross multiplying and then I'm going to FOIL now and simplify them. I do not want to foil the denominator because by now I've seen you've seen the pattern that the numerator will have an H pulled out and that H will cancel with this bottom H. So there is no H to eliminate here, so I don't want to distribute the denominator uh, unnecessarily. And now we can um, substitute 0 for h. Which comes out to be negative 1 over x minus 1 times x minus 1, which is the same as negative 1 over x minus 1, the whole square. So to kind of put them all together, f prime of x is negative 1 over x minus 1 the whole square. In this section, we've made a powerful move from finding the derivative at a point to finding the derivative of the entire function. And what's really spectacular is we can use this to actually find the function, uh, the derivative at a point. So if my x value is, say, 5, then I can find the derivative at 5. If my x value is 7, I can find the derivative at 7. If x is negative 3, I can find the derivative at negative 3. So this gives me the flexibility because it's like a template for the entire function and I can evaluate at any point to find the slope of the tangent line or the derivative uh, in this case. Here is our next problem. We have two parts here. A says to find the derivative of f of x, which is equal to square root of x for x greater than or equal to 0. And part B says, find the tangent line to the curve y equals square root of x at x equals 4. Let's focus on part A. Part A wants us to find the 
derivative. So from the language, um, it uh, becomes clear that I need to find f prime of x. To find f prime of x, we use the definition. So f prime of x, limit h approaches 0. all over h. So f of x plus h, right? Now we have f of x given to be square root of x. So in the place of x, I plug in x plus h. So wherever x occurs, I'll have x plus h. So I'm going to put parentheses under the radical. And I insert x plus h for the entire radical. Please do not put it at the end of the radical outside it. It has to stay inside the radical. All right, now if I plug in zero, we're gonna have zero on the denominator. There's no way to factor out the h. So what is the algebraic move to handle radicals stuck like this? We've seen this before. In fact, we use the conjugate technique to handle these kind of radical situations. So then we will multiply up and down by the conjugate of the numerator. The conjugate of the numerator is square root of x plus h plus square root of x, equal and opposite, and match the same thing down here to preserve the, the value of the expression. And now we are ready to multiply across. You can foil it, but remember again in the conjugate method with radicals, it's, uh, it's always the conjugate method is always the difference of squares. And we know that that's uh, a plus b times a minus b is a squared minus b squared. So it's this idea in conjugate. So we're going to use that idea and simply take the square of each term. Well, the denominator is going to look a little complex, but we know it's all going to go away once the h cancels off and we ap apply h or substitute for h as 0. So bear with that uh, large expression until you're ready to simplify it. The square root and the square will undo each other, and so we have this. In fact, you could have cancelled it in the same step, uh, understanding that you're doing two steps in one. All right, we're close. And plug in h as 0, so we get square root of x plus 0 minus square root of x. I apologize, I've been having that minus throughout. You have see the plus there? I don't know how I missed the plus. Okay. And then we have 1 over 2 square root of x. So let me come over here, and this was f prime of x. f prime of x gives us 1 over 2 square root of x. So this was part A. This is the, the derivative of f of x, which was square root of x. Then we go to part b. Let's go back and see what part b said. Find the tangent line to the curve y equals square root of x at x equals 4. Well, it's the same function, so the derivative would be the slope of the tangent line. So we'll write that little note here. So since the derivative from part A is 
is the same as the slope of the tangent line. We need to evaluate f prime of 4 because remember slope of the tangent line is at a point and so this was for the entire function so at a point was given to us in part b and part b said uh, at x equals 4 so that is our uh, that's a point at, uh, through which the tangent line passes and so we're supposed to find f prime of 4 and let's do that so f prime of 4 will be 1 over 2 square root of 4 which is 1 over 2 times 2, which is 1 over 4. So the slope of the tangent line at x equals 4 is 1 over 4. Now that we have the slope, we need to find the um, equation because that's what they mean by find the tangent line. The equation of the tangent line is, you know, it's y minus y1 times uh, equals m times x minus x1. In order to help us answer that, we were given just one, the x coordinate of it, right? So this implies your f of 4, which is your y coordinate, is square root of 4, which comes out as 2. So the coordinate is x, which is 4, comma y, which is 2. We need this, we need the slope and the point, so we've got the slope to be 1 over 4 and we got the point to be 4 comma 2 we're going to use that to plug in here y minus 2 equals m times x minus x1 which is 4 that's y minus 2 equals x over 4 minus 1 add 2 on both sides we get x over 4 plus 1 you can put it as x over 4 or you can separate them out and say 1 over 4 times x plus 1 if you want to see the m the slope you know explicitly so you'll understand that in math 4 4a we have uh, various ways of expressing the answer and they're all equivalent answers and uh, it just depends on how uh, much you would reduce and how you would even present it so in this case, we're presenting it in two ways. One is a regular expression. The other one is intentionally separating the coefficient of x so that we have the, uh, the slope visible to us. And here are some notations for derivatives. Now, the derivative concept was discovered both uh, by uh, Isaac Newton and by Leibniz. So they both kind of discovered at, the, at about the same time uh, through, uh, through their own uh, approaches, but therefore they used certain notations that were different from each other, quite obviously. And when it came to light that they both were working on it, and you know, at those times it took long for it to, uh, for their, for their uh, discoveries to, to uh, come to the general consensus, uh, it was uh, it was kind of challenging for people to say, okay, I'll choose this notation over the other notation, and that could have uh, you know upset the the two uh, mathematicians. So then you know depending on what approach they used, they were they used these notations interchangeably, and this is what we get from all those um, uh, in different types of notations. So we have f prime of x. We've seen that. If, if you don't write it as a function notation, you can simply say y prime. Then we have dy over dx. This is the same as change in y over change in x. So this is coming convenient in, uh, in uh, physical sciences because there you want to see the change of reaction of something over time. We want to, change, want to see the change uh, in the position of, a, of an object over time. So for all those purposes, this, come, this uh, notation comes in handy df over dx, uh, you know, there's a huge uh, application in, in economics 
that comes from calculus. So you can see that they use this kind of notation. Sometimes, uh, you know, advanced uh, studies, they use all these kinds of notations. Honestly, I personally haven't used much of these, but I've seen these uh, in use in some textbooks. So we have all these notations. Now, uh, just for the sake of this course and for the lesson here, I um, will be using interchangeably one of these three notations. All right. Now, under limits, we have seen that the left-hand limit must be equal to the right-hand limit for limit to exist. And if it doesn't exist, meaning if the left hand and the right hand are not pointing to the same values, we would just say one-sided limit exists, isn't it? Same idea here for derivatives too, because derivatives, as you can see, the definition of the derivative is itself a limit, limit as h approaches 0. So if it exists, good for us. If it doesn't, we can see that there are possibilities for one-sided limits to exist. Uh, therefore, we call it one-sided derivatives. Okay. So if you have um, an interval, so let me say here, differentiable on an interval, one-sided derivatives. For one-sided derivatives, as you can see here in this graph, if we approach, so say this is the function that runs from A to B. And uh, if uh, we call this y equals f of x, if you approach the point A from the right, okay, so to the right of A, that's this, right? So you approach A from the right of A. But if you approach A from the left of A, there is no function to the left of A. So in this case, we can clearly see that only a right-handed limit would exist, therefore a right-handed derivative. Likewise, if you uh, approach uh, the point B from the left, then we have a left-handed derivative that exists, but we don't have a right-handed uh, um, derivative here, meaning we don't have a limit that exists from both sides. So uh, in terms of, of derivative, which is seen also as, uh, as the uh, tangent line, you can see that at this point, if you keep approaching this, you know, with a, with a line, with the tangent line, you see that this becomes the tangent line. And so we have the right-handed or right-hand derivative. And on this side, if we were to keep uh, drawing these, uh, uh, you know, tangent lines at every point and come to this point, you see that that's where you have the left-hand derivative. So what we are trying to uh, explain in this uh, area that we can have one-sided derivatives also. And that is uh, true in uh, functions that do not go endlessly but have a start and end point or one of them. One, st you know, one end starts at a point but goes indefinitely on the other end and vice versa. Let's take a look at this problem. Using the definition, calculate the derivatives of the function g of t equals 1 over t squared and we need to find the derivatives at these three specific points. Okay. Now if we were trying to find the derivative of a function at a point, then we would individually do them for each point. But now that we know that we can find the derivative of a function, the entire function, we can first do that so that you get a generalized template for that uh, derivative. And then for each specific point, we can then uh, plug in those points in the place of t and evaluate it. And that is our, that's going to be our approach here. We will first find g prime of t. For a quick recall, we know that our definition is f prime of x is limit h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Let's uh, remember to translate this for our g function with the variable t. So g prime of t is limit h approaches 0, 
g of t plus h right, minus g of t all over h. So g of t plus h, so that's 1 over t squared and therefore it's going to be 1 over t plus h, the whole squared minus 1 over t squared, that's all in the numerator, divided by h. Again, when we reach this point in, in the problems, the upcoming problems, that those are good places for you to try this problem on your own by pausing the video, especially when you're trying out the LCD and so on, it's really helpful. Now in this, uh, in this problem, I'm going to uh, do um, the flipping of the H right in this step, okay? So I'm going to take the LCD and then cross multiply. Apologize. T squared minus Okay, that's the numerator times the flip of the denominator. Okay. So we got that. So I've taken care of it right here. I do not wish to expand the denominator. Again, because you remember this H that I'm just writing now? That is the one that's uh, expected to cancel off with an H on the top there. So this H is going to care, take, is going, we're going to plug in zero for this H. So leave that H in the, in the square form itself. And remember to distribute the minus. Notice how uh, we pulled out the negative h, and so what's in the parentheses will be positive. You can keep it in the negative form too, that's not a problem, because usually it's only the h we're interested in, not the negative sign, so it's very likely that we're going to have the negative sign. Anyway, going back in. So now it's time to substitute for h as 0. That's negative 2 over t squared times t squared. There is a t on the top, so that will cancel one of the t's. And so we are left with negative 2 over t cubed. So let me write it out together here. G prime of t is negative 2 over t cubed. All right, so this is the, the derivative. Let me put it in a different color. This is the derivative of the function g of t. Now we're going to use this to uh, evaluate at those individual values. So first, let's do g prime of negative 1. That's what we were asked to find. So g prime of negative 1 would be uh, negative 2 over t is negative 1, right? Negative 1. Negative 1, when cubed, gives back a negative. So negative 2 over negative 1, which is positive 2. So g prime of negative 1 is positive 2. Let's try the next one, which was g prime of 2. And that will be negative 2 over, in the place of t, you're going to plug in the 2. So I have that there. Uh, there was no uh, sign for 2, so the negative 2 will be on the top. 
over 2 cubed, which is 8. And that reduces to a negative 1 over 4. And then the last one was to find g prime of root 3, which is negative 2 over root 3 the whole cubed. Root 3 the whole cubed would be um, root 3 times root 3 times root 3. So root 3 times root 3 is a 3. So you'll have a 3 root 3 in the denominator. And that will be your answer for that. All right. So we'll do a similar problem now for the next one. Find the derivatives. Okay. And then they give us the function oops, r of s is square root of 2s plus 1. I'm using a lowercase s, it is a case sensitive here. So watch out for the r and the s. So the variables are r and s. I mean, the function is r and the variable is s. Okay. So let's compare our answers at the end of the problem. r prime of s will be limit h approaches 0. r of s plus h minus r of s all over h. I'm converting this for our problem based on the definition. This is a familiar situation. We've seen the radical, and we know that we have to use the conjugate technique. Multiply the top using difference of squares. As always, I'm not going to do anything. You cannot really do anything to the denominator. It looks uh, big and scary, no problem. We know that it will be sorted in the end. You remember to distribute this minus. I did two things in one. I got rid of the square root and the square. They undo each other. So I wrote down what was inside and I made sure to distribute this minus to the second uh, part of the term. Okay, now because we have seen uh, this type of problem over and over now, I'm going to do multiple steps in one. So please tra follow along with me uh, to see that you are tracking with me. Let me quickly check that was a plus one there. Nice. Okay. So the 2s and the minus 2s, they go away. The plus 1 and the minus 1, they go away. Okay. That's the first step. In the second step, we would be left with 2h over h. And so I can cancel off that h and this h. Okay. Uh, bad color choice, I think. Let me try this color. Okay. 
right? So uh, H and H will go away. You're now, in the third step now, you're left with 2 on the top over this whole thing in the bottom without the H, right? And so we also know that uh, in our uh, fourth step, we will substitute H as 0, okay? So this term will go away, okay, the green term. So pink is the first step, yellow is the second step, and, and um, green is the third step where I plug in H as 0. So after you've plugged in, you cannot still have the limit, right? So all you have now left is there's really uh, 2 in the, in the top, everything else is gone, over square root of 2s plus 1 plus square root of 2s plus 1 in the denominator. Can you see that? So this really, really helps us to eliminate a lot of these uh, steps uh, because these are lengthy expressions by themselves. Now you see that we are not multiplying these two, the square root of 2s plus 1 uh, and the other one, they're not being multiplied, that they're being added because they are like radicals and they have the same same radical. They should if Like radicals are radicals that look alike, isn't it? They must have the same root and the same radicand. And that's what we see here. And therefore, we have 2 times 2s plus 1. And that also cancels off with a 2 on the top. And so we're left with 1 over square root of 2s plus 1. Bringing all this in perspective, all this started with r prime of s, and that was 1 over square root of 2s plus 1. All right, and this was nothing but our derivative of the function r of s. We usually write f of x, but here it was r and s. All right, now we have the um, ones to evaluate. So the first one was r prime of 0, 2 times 0 plus 1. In the place of s, you plug in 0, and we get 1 over uh, 1 over square root of 1, which is, okay, I'll just put it like that. That gives us 1. Then we have r prime of 1, 1 over square root of 2 times 1 plus 1. That gives us 1 over root 3. Cannot simplify that any further. Then we have r prime of half, 1 over square root of 2 times the half plus 1. And you know that the 2s will cancel off. That will be 1 over square root of 2. I suppose that was good for us. Okay. We'll do another problem. And uh, I'm going to slowly introduce the other notation that we use. Okay. So here we go. Find dy over dx if y is 2x cubed. Okay. Remember, this was one of the notations that indicated the derivative. And this is particularly used when we don't have the equation given in the not function notation, like f of x. Instead, if they just say y, we can use dy over dx or sometimes even y prime. Okay, So notation for derivative. You can also use y prime. So they say find y prime. If y equals this, that means finding the derivative. But let's use this notation that they've given us. So dy over dx is the same as f prime of x. Limit. So in these cases, uh, you'll have to kind of reconsider the y as f of x because we've been kind of trained to think of it uh, as um, f of x plus h minus f of x, right? And so if you have it in the y notation, sometimes it can be um, not immediately explicit to us. So no problem. So we have 2 times x cubed. So in the place of x, I now have x plus h. So I leave a spot to uh, plug in x plus h. And then remember, it's cubed. So the a plus b the whole cube formula 
is basically a cubed plus b cubed plus 3ab times a plus b okay or you you if you didn't remember the formula you're basically multiplying it three times over so you'll have to foil these two and that result will have to be distributed to a plus b so your call coming back to the problem Because I'd like to get them individually, uh, this 3ab times a plus b, I've also kind of distributed it. Okay. That's coming from the last term there, all over h. go ahead and cancel off the ones that are alike obviously we're looking uh, we're going after the ones that are non h terms and so we've got those terms kind of clear right there and then we have a 2 and an h that can be pulled out okay and uh, I know that for instance this and this they are uh, like terms this and this these two are like terms so connect uh, col uh, collect all the like terms combine them and uh, so I'm going to do them all in um, multiple steps okay so this and this 6x squared h this and this 6 8 squared x After combine the, combining the like terms, this is what we're left with. And so, if I pull out an H from uh, the numerator, we will have, I can even pull out a 2, but um, it's only the H that's going to cancel it off, so it's not going to reduce it otherwise. So I have 6X squared plus 6XH plus 2H squared all over H. Cancel it off. Then I'm going to plug in h as 0. That's going to be 6x squared plus 6x times 0 plus 2 times 0 squared. Basically giving us 6x squared. So in other words, dy over dx is 6x squared. And this is the derivative of of y dy over dx is the derivative of y so you can see that we used f of x concept to get the answer here but then you always respond to the original question which was in terms of y using dy over dx so we found the derivative of y okay we previously saw that for a limit to exist we needed the left hand limit to be equal to the right hand limit. Similarly, for a derivative to exist at a point, let's say x equals c, then you know you should be able to find the left hand derivative and the right hand derivative at c to be the same number so your left hand derivative must be equal to the right hand derivative what this implies is if f has a derivative at a 
point x equals c, that means the left hand derivative and the right hand derivative are the same, the only, the, the only conclusion you can draw is that f is continuous at x equals c, isn't it? Because you found the derivative from both directions and uh, you know that it implies that f is continuous, then f is continuous at x equals c. But just because a function is continuous does not mean that it has a derivative at that point, okay? Meaning we can't do the reverse of it. And I'm going to show you uh, instances where that uh, is the case. Okay, so one thing is sure that differentiability implies continuity. Or in other words, differentiable functions are continuous. You cannot say the same in reverse. So I'll just say, however, continuity does not imply differentiability. Now, therefore, our, our natural question would be, when does a function not have a derivative at a point, right? So let me write that question here. When does a function not have a derivative at a point? So we can think of, um, you know, two instances where this will have, um, a function will not have a derivative. So this is, um, it implies the derivative dNE, you remember that, does not exist. If the limit is not finite, or is a vertical tangent, what's wrong with a vertical tangent? Vertical tangent is basically a vertical line, and the slope is undefined for it. So for these uh, situations, you'll have that problem. Likewise, remember that differentiation is a smoothness condition. Um, when I say smoothness condition, remember that is what it implies when we say derivative approaches the same point from the left and from the right. So that uh, limit would, would work only if the differentiation is a smoothness condition on f. So if something, if, if the function, if the graph is not smooth at a point, if it's pointy, uh, you know, those are the places where you will not find a derivative to exist. So here are some examples, okay? So here are some examples where derivative um, does not exist at that point. So we have a corner. If we have a corner, then the one-sided derivatives will differ, okay? What they're saying is that the left-hand derivative will not be equal to the right-hand derivative. Uh, another uh, uh, you know, familiar uh, instance is, think of the uh, absolute value function. So at zero, the, the, this is a continuous function, by the way. This is a continuous function, but it is not differentiable at zero, okay? So this is a classic example how, or example of how continuity does not imply differentiability. This is a continuous function, absolute value function is a continuous function, but it is not differentiable at zero. Because if you think of this, if you approach zero from the left, okay, from the left, so that means your pink uh, piece on the left is actually a negative slope, it's a, it's a, it's a decreasing line, right? So the slope is negative. So left-hand uh, derivative is negative, okay? Negative slope. Whereas if you look at the right-hand side, as you approach zero from the right, the right piece of the um, of the 
absolute value function has a derivative that's going to give us a positive slope. So a negative slope and a positive slope from both directions. So that's the reason why at a corner the derivative does not exist. So this is a very nice example for uh, understanding that uh, discrepancy there. Okay. Another condition is when a, the, there is a cusp. Okay, A cusp is like this. You know, that kind of a, a kink. Okay. So uh, some kind of a, a, a quick rise. So that's also pointy as you can see. Right? So what happens here is the left-hand derivative is, uh, say, infinity, and the right-hand derivative, right, can you see that here? So the left-hand derivative is um, infinity, and the right-hand derivative is negative infinity. They don't match, right, and they also are not finite. Then the next condition is the vertical tangent situation. And uh, here too, we have this vertical tangent, meaning your um, slope of the tangent line is actually a vertical line itself. So we know the slope of a vertical line is, uh, is undefined. But if you think about the derivative, the left-hand derivative and the right-hand derivative will be the same, meaning they both will be plus or minus infinity, but it's not a finite limit. It should be a measurable number. Infinity is not a number. So you have uh, the left and the right side being the same value in the sense infinity or positive, infinity or negative infinity, but then we have the issue that it's not a finite limit. And the fourth condition would be discontinuity, as you can see here. Uh, the graph itself is not continuous, right? So you have the discontinuity, and uh, you clearly have totally different limits, right? So the left-hand limit is somewhere down here, the right-hand limit is somewhere down there, up there, and same same holds true here because there is a disconnect. And so for all these reasons, you see that discontinuity also uh, indicates that a derivative does not exist. Um, and I can even add another condition, okay? Five. Uh, this is something we've seen before, rapid oscillation. So you have the graph oscillating and then it's, it's so rapid near that P, say that's the P, you really don't know what's happening and so we have this rapid oscillation that goes up and down P and there's no way for us to figure out what's happening there. The closer you go, it is uh, it just keeps going endlessly. Okay. So what this goes to say is if limit h approaches 0, f of x plus h minus f of x over h, if this is if this exists, it implies that limit h as as h approaches 0 from the left, must be the same as limit h approaches 0 from the right. In other words, the left-hand derivative must be equal to the right-hand derivative. And of course, it must be finite. Now that concludes our lecture for this section here in Chapter 3. We will continue on with the same chapter in the next video. See you soon.